good morning, everyone. I think we'll uh, get started on this panel. Thank you for joining us this morning on the panel on the data engineering lifecycle. I am Louise D. Leritz. I'm, uh, I'm at Coalesce with a caster doc. It's a data catalog uh, that is disrupting data management uh, through AI. And I'm also the host of uh, the Data Couch podcast, a podcast that uh, is trying to simplify a lot of the data conversations. Um, I'll start by introducing our three uh, great speakers. Um, I'll start with um, Matthew, who's the CTO of uh, Ternary Data, and also co-author of the book, uh, Fundamentals of Data Engineering, which you probably have all uh, heard of or read. Um, <laughs> And uh, we, we also have Mehdi, who's a developer advocate at the MotherDoc, a serverless analytics platform powered by DuckDB. You also might have heard of MotherDoc. It made a lot of noise in the data community in the past few months. And then we have Sung, who's the um, solution engineer at Datafold. Uh, Datafold is an automated uh, testing platform for data engineers. Uh, so today, the goal is to dive deep in the data engineering lifecycle. But before we do that, I like to set the context and set the stage so we are all on the same page uh, with this discussion. So as defined in uh, Fundamentals of Data Engineering, which is co-authored by uh, Matthew and uh, Joe Race, the data engineering lifecycle is a structured journey that takes raw data to valuable end products. Uh, the different stage of the lifecycle include data generation, storage, ingestion, transformation, and serving. It's also tightly intertwined with important elements like security, data management, uh, and orchestration. Uh, Math, you have co-authored the book, so you are the best person to elaborate a little bit on this uh, definition. Could you uh, provide some more context for our audience this morning? Yeah. Everyone hear me? Yeah, so there are a few things here. Um, when Joe and I were writing the book, one thing we really tried to emphasize is concepts that had st stood the test of time already and that would stand the test of time in the future. And so I think there had been a tendency in the era of Picadoop, maybe ending four or five years ago, to say that data engineering was a particular technology. So data engineering is Spark, or data engineering is the Hadoop file system. And then what we realized is that technology evolved very, very fast after that. And we saw a proliferation and a diversity of new services and open source frameworks emerge. And so when you're defining data engineering, it's really uh, important to focus on the job of data engineering, on what you're trying to accomplish. And you need to figure out what the job is first and then figure out what the technologies are. And in the past, we'd kind of gotten that cycle backwards. And so that was our real emphasis. And hopefully, I mean, there are things that I would probably change in the book in a second edition now. But I think the overall concepts are still there and hopefully will hold for another decade at least as things evolve and as the cloud changes and as other trends come and go. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Matt. Um, the, the, this conversation is stemming from the fact that the data engineering life cycle is at an exciting uh, crossroad. Um, so we've been increasingly incorporating software engineering principle into data engineering practices, uh, which was necessary to navigate the complex data landscape that we evolve in. Uh, but now, if we take a moment to rewind a little bit, uh, what are the challenge and the gaps in the data engineering lifecycle that brought the industry to this juncture where we start to incorporate software engineering principle in the data engineering practice? Uh, so why are we here today discussing the, the, the solutions and enhancement in the engineering workflow? Um, Matt, for this one, I'd like to turn to you again uh, can you please share uh, your take on uh, what is wrong today with the life cycle of data engineering? Uh, what I'd say in terms of what's wrong, there's actually a positive side of this and then a negative side. And so the positive side is that as we moved out of that, what I would call the era of big data engineering, we actually didn't lose the big data part. It's just that big data became the default, like you could do big data in almost any tool that was off the shelf. And we saw a big democratization in data engineering and suddenly it became much, much easier. So now I could just go to the cloud console 
and I could have BigQuery or Snowflake or a number of different tools running in my browser in seconds and I could run queries. And that was fantastic. It meant that the uses of data could spread to many, many more organizations and data became much more accessible. But the downside of that is that with democratization, you need a lot more responsibility to go with that. And we're still working on that part. And so I think fundamentally that's what conferences like this are about, is like training and best practices and getting better at our jobs. And I think we're still, we've seen data stacks deployed in many, many more organizations. And so we're now in that process of like catching up on best practices and training and such, and doing things like managing costs and then maybe maturing into these amazing tools that we have at our disposal now. That's kind of my take on it. I think I have not take on this. Uh, I feel the general del delivery pace of data teams have been slowing down recently. Um, and I think it's because of the increased complexity of the modern data stack and the demands. And so we reach a point, I think why we are asking the question now that, that the slowness start to be the new norm. I guess many of you like felt like put tickets in JIRA for a data team and wait a week, sometimes a month, and it's just normal to have uh, that wait longer for for uh, a feedback from the data teams. And I think there is nothing to blame on that because it's kind of a normal uh, way of doing things. We build tools and we increase complexity with that. And so I think one big challenge that we have to go now is simplify the, the, the stack, but also coming back to the developer experience because that's become a bit a backseat and an afterthought. And we got that also in the keynote. Right with the with the developer experience, uh, and so I think that's that's something we need to take care of, more of that. What do you think? Uh, yeah, I, I think to your guys' points, like big data has become such a default. I remember starting off my career in 2014, and I thought fast looked like taking a five-hour query and turning it into one hour, and I was so proud to brag about that. <laughs> and now we're at a place where I think our collective imaginations like have some breathing room because things are fast enough, DBT has made things ergonomic enough, where like you're answering these anecdotal questions that are still really tough to answer well. Some of them I'm gonna list off. Hey, what's historical performance on this and am I beating it? Hey, how often does this fail in production? Who uses this model and how often? And I'm adding all these new models. Is it worth the money to run this in production every day? And you notice all those questions, you're probably imagining you're in a dialogue like, oh, that's about two to three clicks, a couple tabs. And you maybe do that like 10 times in a row if you're gung-ho and are type A like me. But after a while, you grow numb to it and you're just like, oh, I'm going to kind of quiet those questions down because it's not worth the friction to do so. And I think we're getting to a certain point where it's like, all right, it is worth the friction to do some of these things. Or maybe someone will create a solution to just melt away all the toil in answering those questions and I just get to be immersed in my work. And so yeah, to your point, I think it's going to be a lot more about developer experience and just like making me feel like the hero of my own data story. So yeah, that's my take. Thank you for these uh, three hot takes, um, but <laughs> enough. Um, yeah, scorching. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, enough of uh, problems. Maybe we, we, we can talk about the solutions to the frictions in the data engineering um, life cycle. So now I'd, I'd like to explore, Matt, you mentioned the, the technologies that are supporting us in our reducing this friction. Now I'd love to explore the technical landscape that is bridging the gaps in the life cycle of data management. So the data engineering field is evolving uh, super quick. We have new tools uh, every, every year uh, that, are, that are popping. Uh, the, the concept, especially of modern data stack in a box, has recently caught the attention as a game changer that would enable more efficient, localized data development and management. Uh, so I, I would like to, to ask what are the current solutions or emerging technologies that have been introduced to improve the, the life cycle uh, of data engineering. Uh, Song, I would like to get your take on that. Uh, what are the, the solutions and emerging technologies that you see uh, are starting to transform the life cycle? All right, data beautiful. All right, I'm going to ease you into my answer before I get a little woo-woo at the end. All right? Um, I think what I love about this question is that it comes at such a juicy time where I think our collective inner dialogue 
is saying like it's 2023, things should be so much faster and cheaper and ergonomic than they feel right now as the standard, just because like I think I think a lot of us has played, at least to some degree, with things like DuckDB or some data scientists and like Polars and other tools. And like I've seen YouTube tech influencers come in your TikTok feeds of just like, look how ergonomic my setup is. And you're just like, hey, like how come that's not my reality right now, right? And you know, addressing a lot of these things, I like categorize them into like three themes of like speed, predictability, and interoperability. You know, some of the current and emerging things I'm seeing is like DuckDB and Polars here. And notice everything I name out loud is open source and you can literally use today. And so that's intentional. Um, and I think a big part of it is like our laptops are a lot more powerful than we think. I still remember running my first DuckDB SQL query and it broke this anchoring point within me because I thought fast looked like taking a DBT run from five minutes to like one minute and just bragging about that. But now I literally proved this out. You can run 28 SQL operations with DuckDB and DBT and 0.88 seconds i think that's 880 milliseconds and i'm just like oh my gosh like why isn't this like more normal to how i work because it's faster and just free not even just cheaper it's just free on my machine maybe i pay like two cents on my electrical utility bill for that i think the other thing is you know polars where it's like think like pandas built in rust where i think it's open the imagination of like data scientists and people that want to live in that data frame centric kind of workflow and go like oh like my jupyter notebook can do a lot more than i think it should uh, at this point. And I think it's creating this collective momentum of like, oh, like anytime I work in dev, it should just be for free, like full stop, just because there's so much like battle testing out there, so many random blogs, so many like YouTube influencers that are just showing us like, oh, like this is possible. This isn't just like some one niche POC. Okay, so there's predictability. Um, two things I want to mention are like data diff and Apache Iceberg. You know, I used to work at DBT Labs for two years before I joined Datafold. You know, a big reason I chose to work at Datafold is because, you know, they were solving a problem that deeply matters to me and that 100% matters to all of you, and that's less boring toil ad hoc SQL in my life. I know all of you have, like, like put some filthy ad hoc joints together to, you know, differentiate between dev and prod. Some of you have just run, like, some simple, like, select count star all from, and I just want to, you know, eyeball some row counts here. And, like, you probably do that 20 times over. It's, like, the open, dirty secret all of us do, but none of us, you know, none of us are really proud to brag about that. And, you know, I think what, what's so charming about why I joined Dataful is because we, you know, open source a free utility called data diff, where essentially like we just melt away all that ad hoc SQL, where it's like, hey, like literally compare your DBT models in dev to prod, here's all the summary stats, here's the data type changes, move on with your life. You don't need to set up DBT audit helper, I know that's a pain in the butt for a lot of you that want to set that up. Um, and, you know, the second piece is Apache Iceberg, which is an open table file format. And I think honestly, like, I'm sure you folks have like seen the, the, the rap sheet there, but just one thing is like schema evolution, where like I know all of us have felt devastated when you're like, damn, I have to run dbt run dash dash full refresh because I messed up something and how I track, you know, the schema evolution of this thing, or it's like I thought append only would work and I could just, you know, numb myself out to other edge cases, but you know, like, I want to live in a world where like, we don't have to care about schema evolution because some tech is doing the accounting behind the scenes. Right? And now this is the woo-woo part. All right? And this is mechanically possible today. And so hear me out before you write it off completely. So I saw murmurs of this in the DBT public Slack and talking with other like, practitioners. But imagine running DBT against DuckDB for free in your development environment. And then when you need to push it to prod and things like Snowflake, or Databricks, you use something called SQL got to transpile that DuckDB flavored SQL into that cloud respective flavored SQL. And then if you want to like have a sanity check, run data diff to compare against the two and maybe throw an Apache iceberg in the mix if you want to have a little fun and test out schema evolution for your incremental runs. And what's so powerful about this is like, what does this sound like? It sounds like spiritually Docker and Kubernetes to a certain degree, right? And I think what's so beautiful about this is like, you know, there's already a battle-tested blueprint, you know, in our hands, and I think we get to copy and paste a lot of cool stuff from that. All right, that's my spiel. Boo! No, I'm, <laughs> I'm a big fan. <laughs> I'm a big fan of uh, of, uh, of the DuckDB. I'm a bit biased because Mother Duck is DuckDB in the cloud, and I joined them in February. But one thing I, I really strongly agree with you is like we think in terms of minutes of duration of jobs, and that's not normal. Your smartphone 
is like what used the compute be the used computer spec like you know five ten years ago. So we should think in terms of second, right? So that's like the example you you, you give. Uh, and so like the, if you think in terms of uh, of second, then we need to rethink uh, kind of the the full development cycle. So it's not just about DBT, but it's really everything from end to end. And how does that look like? Where well, there is solution, as you explained with with DuckDB, but how to leverage the 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 local compute and not just like pushing things to the cloud. I think the next thing is that instead of having a local client, you have a client which is kind of acting as a node of your cluster, which is in the cloud. And so it acts in concert with both your local compute and your cloud compute. So one, one example I can give you, there is two technology I'm really um, looking for is WASM. So WASM is the ability, how many people knows WASM, have heard about WASM? Okay, not, not so many, it's, it's a data audience. But in software engineering, there, it's really a hot topic because basically it enables you to run a different kind of code in the browser, rather than Python or whatsoever, really efficiency, really close to a desktop app. So you can have really impressive browser app experience without installing anything, okay? So that's one thing. The other thing is a web GPU. Who has heard about the web GPU? Okay. Few people, the same from WASM. <laughs> um, so Web GPU is a web standard that is popping up and is being supported now earlier this year by Chrome. And what enables you is basically it's a protocol to tap directly into the GPU of your machine from the browser. So your browser can leverage your local GPU. Great, you're gonna have amazing games directly in the browser without <laughs> installing anything. Yes, coming back to data, where do we need GPU? Come on, where do we need GPU? Machine learning, Machine learning. yeah, model training. So you can imagine an experience where basically you opening a browser, you have all your development set up in Python whatsoever, and you're training your model locally. And then when you need to push things out to the cloud, you just, you know, it's act as a concert where maybe you have but some part of the training locally and the rest is going to be on the cloud. And for sure there is question about data movement, egress, ingress, but I think those are less concerned because network bandwidth have been getting much better and also internal also. So th there is much more experience basically to act more than just a client that sends SQL uh, over a cloud service. And so coming back to DuckDB, so that's what we are uh, aiming for with Mother Duck. It's basically you have DuckDB, which can process locally, and you can do hybrid queries where you can join data locally and on the cloud, and it leverages your local compute. But DuckDB can also run in the browser with Wasm, so you can have your uh, basically analytics environment just in the browser, but it's running locally, right? It's running locally. It's not like just a web server, which is a Jupyter notebook on the cloud. It's leveraged your local compute, so less cost on the cloud, and we finally get to use properly or expensive MacBook. So uh, that's my take. What, what's your take on, on this, uh, Matthew? So I, I think the other thing I'm seeing, which fits in with the themes that you both have brought up, is that we're seeing a real maturity of orchestration. And DBT is part of that, as our Airflow itself was kind of the first you know, modern Python or orchestration platform has gotten much more mature, much more powerful. You have these various other competitors like Prefect and Mage and Daxter that offer all kinds of new features for orchestration. And when you combine that with uh, development environments that use things like Polar or uh, like Polar or DuckDB, and you now have a development environment where you can seamlessly move from your local machine into a containerized environment and basically process data the same way. And you can take these containers that you develop on locally and scale them up vertically and actually process quite a bit of data without going to a cluster environment. And I think that's quite exciting from a data engineering perspective. I mean, I think for the vast majority of workloads, that type of uh, fairly seamless deployment environment will meet almost all our needs with us occasionally having to go into big data and use true cluster services like Spark. But I think this type of deployment model we're going to see more and more in the near future with, with just the mature maturation of multiple technologies in that regard. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for, for covering the 
uh, there's a lot of, uh, of tools here that can really help um, bridge the gaps in the data engineering life cycle. So thank you for going over uh, so many of them. Uh, a, a good breadth of, uh, of tool here. Uh, but now um, I think now that we've talked about tools, uh, let's talk about the human side of the data engineering life cycle. Uh, so recently we've seen not just changes in the tooling and methods as uh, we just uh, uh, talked about, but also in the roles that people play on our data teams and on our analytic analytics team. When you think about it, the roles of an uh, analytics engineer uh, is super new, uh, and it's also new that data engineers are getting more comfortable and embracing uh, software engineering techniques. Um, so what does it all mean for how we work together and how our data teams function uh, and the skills that we need to, to make our data teams work, um, uh, work well. And for the data engineers, uh, how are their roles set to change as they embrace uh, more of the software engineering uh, practice? Uh, what does it all mean for the orchestration of the data engineering uh, life cycle? Uh, Mehdi, for this one, I'd like to turn to you and how this uh, sh shift in role we will create a ripple effect on, on data teams and, and business teams altogether. Yeah, uh, I've touched this topic uh, quite a lot on my uh, content on YouTube. I felt a bit attacked like this YouTuber influencer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're one of them. Number one, baby. Oh, man. Uh, but anyway, I think there is, there is two, two. First, we need to acknowledge that, uh, to recognize that there is an issue with the role definition in data. So it's a, it's a big mess at the moment. And the reason is, is that our job title uh, remains constant. Like data engineer has been there for like the past seven, eight years. I mean, before it was called something else. But our responsibility and task have been changing those past years and even exploded if you're uh, a data engineer specifically because you're at the center. And the other side of things is that companies uh, adopt new technologies at different pace and they also you know have different interpretation than of what a data engineer should be doing you know in their company so just like search to data engineer data engineer uh, job offers and you're gonna see it's wild west out there it's a bit scary you can see some people asking for dashboard other from like back-end Java stuff um, so that's that's because of this thing where our responsibility has evolved but the job title mostly remain uh, constant so now that we know that um, and we take data engineer with sort of grant and so one of my blog and video is stop using the term data engineer so what else can we use because we still need kind of a role title to you know quickly speak about responsibility that we are doing there is the data platform engineer that we've been seeing emerging. Uh, so basically, before going actually to this role, one easy f uh, way that I, uh, I see how to uh, see how the role definition is going to evolve and how it is today is to see what has become common uh, commodity in the data engineering uh, workspace. So what are the tasks that we used to do seven, eight years you know, ago that are now available off the shelf? So the first thing has been also mentioning in the keynote is like, you know, cloud and server management. So you don't have to set up yourself or your own cluster, uh, your own cloud for, for Hadoop. You can just with a click or an API call uh, create that cluster. So server management goes away. But then so what kind of responsibility take, take it back? Because you have now more free time. You could reduce your work time. That's also an, an option. Uh, but you can basically go at a higher level instead of managing server you manage infrastructure and you manage framework infrastructure to give the possibility of other people to launch their cluster with a click right and so that's where data platform engineer have been involving is that enables not only internally not just managing one internal data stack but also you know giving framework so that other people can spawn their own data stack, right? So that's where infrastructure as a code coming, et cetera. So those data platform engineer are going strongly, especially you know, in scale up in bigger companies to enable other people basically to own their infrastructures also. 
And the other side uh, that has been evolving is everything related to developing pipelines. So you were mentioning that with SQL and the Cloud Data Warehouse. So like 10 years ago, if you wanted to write a big data job, you had to know Java and do MapReduce job, and that was really painful. And even Spark back then was really painful. And so now the technical barrier to entry has been lower. And so anyone can write a big data pipeline in SQL. Okay, so you don't need, you, you still need to know, you know, the internals and some fundamentals, it's really important, but it's not a requirement to build the pipeline, right? So that was, again, a task that a data engineer used to do, develop in code and understand, you know, distributed compute. No, that goes away. And basically what's left uh, for new space is basically understanding more the business side of thing, because when I was working on, bi on a big data cluster, Mostly, I get the requirement from business, and I mostly implement the pipeline because I don't have time to build this business knowledge. There is so much things going on, on a, around the distributed compute. But now there is the you know, emergence of the analytics engineer, which is closer to the business. Um, and so this is where basically the two roles I can see that split. Like We don't have kind of the traditional data engineer, and it still exists, again, because it depends on uh, how fast your company adopts new technology and new process. So that doesn't mean that the traditional data engineer is disappearing, but on average, it's splitting uh, towards uh, data platform engineer and analytics engineer. And again, if you want to see where it's going to split more, you just need to see what's going to become common commodity in the data engineering landscape. And what we have been seeing a lot lately is like writing SQL. We don't even need to write SQL anymore. Databricks announced like the English SDK, where basically you say what you need and it's translated into a SQL query and so many uh, partners and uh, cloud provider, including Murder Deck actually, <laughs> is just going into that train. So again, you can think, okay, if we are not spending time to write SQL, where are we gonna spend our time next? What's, what's our, our next responsibility to just be more productive? You know, I think, let, let me build on that to say that I, I think the human skills are probably, probably need to be our top focus as data engineers, whether it's being on the platform side or the analytics side. I think that's really where there's an opportunity to improve what we contribute to the business. And in the DevOps world, there's this idea of moving left. And the fundamental idea is if you were to draw a diagram of, of DevOps on the one side, on the left, you have software development, and on the right, you have the ops side. And traditionally, those were very separated. And the idea of the whole DevOps movement is that the ops side is supposed to get much more involved on the left side of the diagram. They're supposed to connect with people building the software and get involved very early rather than treating it as like, okay, I write the code and I throw it over the fence and now it's someone else's problem. And if I'm ops, I tell the software developers what the problem is, but I don't help them to fix it. We're supposed to want to move toward collaborating and movie, working together to fix things. And I think we have very similar opportunities in data engineering um, specifically, the traditional division of labor, especially in the days when we called data engineers ETL developers or database administrators, they were basically a type of data engineer, was the throw it over the wall approach, right? So developers would write code, they generate data in some crazy ORM schema, and then it was the data engineers or the ETL developers job to try to untangle the mess that they got. And I think now, as data engineers, we have the opportunity to move left and actu actually collaborate with the developers who are generating the data so that we can build analytics applications from the get-go right into the code. And we can have a vision of what um, analytics we want to have inside our SaaS platforms and our applications and what business it, the business side of the house might want to do with that data right away rather than trying to untangle a big, uh, big mess. Um, I think there's another layer where we can think about moving left, and that is if I'm thinking from the perspective of individual contributors, and so analysts, data scientists, machine learning engineers, they're not all ICs. They work in various larger teams, but often they're treated as simply downstream of data engineering, and the data engineers just sort of throw the data over the wall to those teams. And so as an analyst or as a data scientist, you can move left by communicating more with data engineering and being involved in the pipeline development process early so you get exactly what you need and you can realize new opportunities, opportunities with data rather than just simply consuming what's given to you. 
So that's kind of my perspective. I think there are many other skill development uh, opportunities as well. But if you can build those human skills and then build your technical skills around those, that's where you're really going to move your career forward. Cool. I think those are pretty good. I think like, it, it speaks to something where it's less about, oh, I'm a data engineer and I know this particular tool. It's just like, I am just a problem solver and I happen to use data as that attack vector. And I think we're seeing that more and more um, because never has it felt more mainstream that like you can make money selling data and licensing data. We have clear examples of that with Reddit monetizing the API. We have, you know, with like authors suing OpenAI for using their books, you know, to store in their training data sets. Like we're seeing just like, it's just so front and center in, in the mainstream zeitgeist that I think it like increases, you know, the surface area of what like ownership and pressure looks like for data engineers. Um, in particular, it takes a lot of like nice to haves of like, oh, I guess testing is nice to have. Oh, I guess observability. Oh, I guess SLAs are nice to have. So like, oh no, if we don't have these things, like we don't make money as a company, <laughs> right? And like there's that ratchet up. And I think as, as an addition to that, it's like, it's curious to see what are the derived incentives afterwards of like, okay, who are the people I need to talk to? Like speaking to the human skills part of like, oh, I can't just be like, oh, look how cool my code and data is. It's like, oh, like I have to tell a story about like, oh, is this clean data set? When I talk to an accountant or the CFO, oh, this will make you money. This will save you money. Here's direct causal impact of how this data helps you tell that story. In addition to like talking to software engineers, because you need APIs and a UI on top of that data in order to show that. And I think what's even more exciting is that I think we all get paid a lot more <laughs> as a result. And like I've seen data engineering job posting specifically for companies that like sell proprietary data or so go all the way to like fang levels of like two, three hundred k. You know, and that's just base. And I think it's just, it's so exciting to see um, that our field is taken that much more seriously and people are starting to see us go from cost centers to revenue drivers. So I'm excited for that world and seeing what incentives uh, that draws out of people. Yeah, and what, one comment on, on what you said about like, I mean, the human side of things is super important, was always important, but I think it's getting better because we are lowering the technical barrier. So I was, as I was saying, it's like we enable other people to do more complex tasks. Uh, because before, when I was writing a Java pipeline and the business say, yeah, but actually, can you change that filter? Yeah, good luck, go you know, fix my Java code. It's like impossible to read if you're not a Java developer, right? So now like it's only, you know, only need to know SQL. And as I said, like tomorrow, maybe you don't need to know SQL. Um, so I think we're in an exciting time where because this technical barrier to entry is getting, you know, lower than the language, the base language requirements is, you know, to meet each other from the technical side and the business is getting easier to do. As I, I, as I can see, because I speak more SQL as interface with the business than I used to be. Wow, you three are making me want to transition to data engineering now. We can make th um, that happen. <laughs> you talked about a lower technical barrier and a higher salary. I'm, uh, I'm in for that. Uh. Wombo combo, baby. Um, OK, well, a good panel um, uh, always has uh, some controversy to it. Uh, so I, I wanted to, to ask uh, your thoughts on, uh, on a statement that uh, we've heard uh, whispered in the corridors of uh, Coalesce. Should uh, all the data engineers become software engineers? Um, should we merge the skill set? Uh, should we blur uh, the difference between the, the two roles? Uh, Sang, I know you made a YouTube video on the, on the topic. I didn't watch it, uh, but... <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> I appreciate the honesty. Wow, but being you, controversial also you on your side. <laughs> But if you if if you could um, yeah give us your your thought on that controversial topics, um, I think we'd all love it. Yeah, I, I think it's already existed for a couple of years, whether we like it or not. Um, particularly like in fan companies or like big tech, where like you've probably seen on LinkedIn, software engineer, comma data, software engineer, comma data platform, or like if they don't want to say data engineer because they're afraid of like being pigeonholed, data infrastructure engineer, data platform engineer, um, and. It's like one of those things where like, I think one of the big distinctions of like data engineer, software engineer, I guess from like, from the front lines and anecdotally, is just like whether like, um, like you make money or like sell like a customer facing product feels like the tone of it at times. Uh, but I think like data engineers, I think by default have to in order to like 
own and live up to the responsibilities of like actually selling data to like everyday people like you and me where you essentially have to build tooling like you've noticed some people building like random data tools in rust part of it is for you know resume hype but another part of it is like they want things to go like super duper fast right and i've seen you know some companies i remember like talking with like Netflix a couple of years ago, they forked their own version of Spark and Parquet, and I was like, good God, like that sounds like so much work. But it's because they see the need to adopt some of like, we need to build our own tools in order to be better data engineers. And I think, I think a lot of us are gonna organically see some of that. I mean, a lot of you have probably built like DBT packages that are internal or public. A lot of you have built like little command line utilities in order to do your job. And like, those are, you know, the design behaviors and you know, things and the incentive structures that software engineers live and breathe every day. So there already are, is my, my answer. So my take on this question is it depends. I guess any controversial answer comes down to it depends. But uh, one of the common issues I've seen in for software engineers transitioning to data engineering is that if their background is in like building fairly simple services that are just like column response API services, then they'll tend to try to deploy the same approach to data and they'll tend to try to process one record at a time which really doesn't work as anyone who's worked with data knows you've got to think in a totally different like parallel mindset which actually sql is extremely good for the sql is a set theoretic language uh, but i i think at the same time um, with the strong background you have in software engineering, with a little bit of retraining, you can become a very strong data engineer and you can move up that chain of abstraction to think about data in a different way rather than single records as something you process in parallel using these tools that mostly do a lot of the work for you behind the scenes so you can think about the data itself. Now there's another angle on this, which is we're seeing more and more frameworks which kind of take away a lot of the, the work of moving data out of applications into analytics, where you basically can just hook your application right into a tool in the cloud, and you immediately get a dashboard or you immediately get a table off of the stream of events coming out of your application. And I think that's the, the really powerful trend for m merging these professions where I, as a software engineer, will just be able to think about my application. Of course, I want to think about how I'm designing the data events that I'm generating so they're good for the type of analytics that I want to create. But frankly, I, I hate to say it, but I think that will eliminate a lot of data engineering jobs. If I can just run a, uh, create a table right on top of my application events and immediately have a dashboard in my SaaS product that I'm building as a brand new startup, of course, big companies will still need data engineering, but that's going to make the job a lot easier where I immediately can have customer value coming out of analytics right off of this event stream. Yeah, but I think it, this is already happening, right? We have seen uh, some some responsibility, as I was saying earlier, just shifting away because new products are arriving. But I feel for me, it's more like data engineer is a, a kind of a specialty of a software engineer. so they need kind of the same foundation. And we've seen that, that there is a reason why, again, I'm bringing that up, but at the keynote, there was a developer software engineer life cycle, right? And so we need to get inspiration from that. And actually, Joe Race uh, posts sometimes on, on LinkedIn, if you want to know what's happening next in data, look at software engineering. And I think there is a lot to take, and we are taking it a lot, we're like versioning. So DBT brought, you know, brought out best practice of software engineer to version SQL, and that's, that's, that's like basics and normal for any software engineer, but to, you know, version, uh, uh, but version on SQL, that's still pretty new for data teams, right? Before it was just, well, we run it there, and sometimes some backend people for maintenance or other reason, they have like scheduled queries, but anyway, so there is that, the CICD stuff, same thing, that's foundation coming from software engineer, but then, as you said also, like, not everything is the same working in data so but i think we need to get inspiration still for like uh, the development's uh, life cycle i think if you look at how you can build a website today it's pretty easy there is like you know standards popping up like you start a react application and you have really quick feedback regarding your development loops uh, loop cycle you don't need any cloud dependency, you write something, you know, on your JavaScript and you get like, what's the page in the website directly. Building data pipeline is far from responsive <laughs> that, like that. And I think we need to go to, to, to that experience. But again, we have the challenge of working with data and we cannot just work with mock data. Like any front end developer, they don't care about 
what data they're showing up on their on their website. But for a data person, yeah, we need data, and actually working with synthetic data is pretty hard. So you need like sometimes production data because you don't have good staging data. So there is a whole lot challenge around this, but I feel like the foundation remain the same. And we can also see on the vendor side. So vendors like DBT bringing up, you know, versioning on SQL and CI/CD pipeline for projectional uh, SQL pipeline. But we've also seen that on the business um, business intelligence tool. So now we have dashboard as a code. And yeah, your dashboard is an asset, is a software asset. And I think like people need to realize that, that if you have a, an executive looking at the dashboard, this should be versioned. You should have different environment. You should be able to, you know, quickly roll back to a certain version. It's not just a new UI thing where someone, you know, update or, you know, refresh a connection. And so that's just software engineers. So like working with different environment version and that and some dashboarding tool now provide the ability to, to have that, to have your, your dashboard as a code and embrace the software engineering foundation. So again, I think we, we still have a long way to go to, to get there. But for me, we're just getting the inspiration of software engineer as a foundation and we apply as a basically specifically for, for data engineer. Yeah, um, well, we have our answer. It, uh, it depends. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> there clearly is something to, to take uh, from um, software engineering uh, principle and bring this in the, in the data engineering life cycle. Um, I have one last question uh, for you. Uh, is, uh, is I'd like to take the time to think about the future, to dream a little bit, uh, and ask you if you could change one thing about uh, the data engineering life cycle, what would it be? Uh, how would it make your life easier? Uh, and what do you think the future holds for the field? Uh, Matt, could I start by having your take on that? Oh, let's see, one thing that I could change. Again, I, I'll go back to what I, I said in my first answer, and that is um, I think just more training on best practices and the establishment of more best practices in our industry that are general and not tied to specific tools will make the discipline much, much better. It will solve a lot of problems that we're seeing right now, like exploding costs, like issues with privacy, just having more general training. And it will make, if your colleagues have more training, then your job as a data engineer is going to be better. And if you have more training, your, your, also, your life is also going to be way better. OK. Sung, any? Yeah, I, I think for me is I hope it just becomes so absurdly normal that we're all selling data. And I say that because of all the deep incentives that will derive as a result. And whether we like it or not, there'll be this inner momentum to go like things should be a lot faster and cheaper and more ergonomic. And I'd be excited to see how all of your imaginations manifest that. Yeah, for me, I would just get the fat in terms of tooling. I agree that like the human side of thing is really important, but I think we we are just struggling like with the complexity of all the you know the the integration that we need to maintain and so on. And I want like to have like as I said like a better development experience as a web developer. I'm building a website locally. I push it to the cloud down. Um, where here it's uh, it's far more complicated than that. And I think the the general mindset is, is going through that. And I'm really glad I've seen that at the keynote uh, today. Um, but this is really, we should think in terms of seconds and not in terms of hours and minutes uh, for our development life cycle and also for, for our data tasks for, for our business that it should be translated into hours or day, not weeks or months. Yeah. Uh, I like all these uh, aspirations. Uh, on this note, I think it's uh, time to uh, close out this uh, this panel and um, open the floor for some questions. Uh, if you have any any questions, it's a uh, time to ask them to our speakers. Yes. Hi. So one thing that's kind of been a theme of your discussion is more and more, I guess, kind of the technical pieces are being kind of eroded away due to developments of technology. Something that came to mind was like how the kind of lost art of normalization has completely been removed due to expanding data sources. Do you feel like there needs to be an active concern about protecting or maintaining the value of these kind of lost arts over time? Or do you think it's not really an issue for the future of the industry that some of these skills just are completely unnecessary anymore? 
I'll, I'll speak to normalization specifically. Um, I think part of the problem we've run into with normalization is that we're still waiting for like the next maybe great American data book or something that that tells us about data modeling. And what I mean by After that- After your books. <laughs> yeah, 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 well, no, 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 no. <laughs> Not claiming that. But what, what I mean by this is that we had, in the early days of data warehousing, we had Kimball and other methodologies that really carved out and said, not only here are the normal forms, but actually this is how you should normalize your data in practice to give it meaning. And here, here are facts and here are dimensions. And then we got to the era of columnar databases and Hadoop, and with the data lake, we just threw all that all out without a replacement. I remember I was going through some Google training for BigQuery a few years back, and in the slides, it literally just said, like, denormalize your data. And I'm like, what does that even mean? Like, are we saying one big table? Like, what? I know, roughly speaking, like what normalization is is a specific definition. But what what does it mean to denormalize? I, I mean, I don't think one big table is the answer. I think we need to find a good hybrid approach that works with these new tools, but still defines some degree of normalization that also adds meaning to the data. And so when I talk about best practices, part of it is training, and part of it is like putting more stakes in the ground to say, if you're using columnar database, if you're using uh, Parquet or BigQuery or Snowflake, these are best practices. They're not absolute, but like work within these frameworks to define how you're going to model your data and do a degree of normalization without the extreme normalization that we had in the era of row-based databases. Any other questions? It's a perfect answer. I, <laughs> I have nothing to add to that. I don't think I answered the whole question. There was the, the <laughs> lost arts. We didn't talk about the lost arts. So. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Um, my question is, I think you talked about, if it's fair to say, uh, issues with like bureaucracy, communication, that sort of stuff, uh, benefits of like new technology, stuff like that. Um, I think Mindy maybe just touched a little bit on like the problem with the explosion of our stack. So could you talk more about the technical anti-patterns, maybe one level lower about what y'all see is like concerning? Yeah, so I think I think the you were mentioning like we are need to build our own tools to speed up things and um, and so a lot of like data teams build DBT like tool before that DBT was a thing I did it in Scalp I know like uh, Twitter Reddit did it too um, and so I think the problem over there is that afterwards you end up with a complexity in certain company where you have isolation and not like common standard that kind of do the same thing, right? And the challenge that if you are building that internally where I build it in Klarna, it's like it's so big that it's really like almost impossible to get it out and go on the DBT train, even if we will get more features, right, it's coming from the community and DBT. And so I think one anti pattern I can see is that people tend to build sometimes too fast tooling, um, you know, internally without looking or contributing to what's available open source. It's it's kind of a, like a, a normal pattern where you know you have like ten different people building the same framework and you know like a VC investor and and only one will survive and ten people are gonna jump onto onto that train. But I think that's like also. I mean, a bad side effect where we tend to build too much things internally without contributing. So I think uh, one one key solution over there is to go more to open source and can more have this mindset of contributing. And it's not like it shouldn't be like on your free time because sometimes like that's how it's interpreted. Oh, I contributed, you know, on open source for fun. No, that should be part of your work. Like if you manage to, you know, have a technology approval within your company, you can spend time contributing to that project, you know, open source project as part of you or your work employee time. So I think this is something we need to see as a trend. I don't know if you have a take. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think the big thing is, I think it's so easy to pre-optimize, look at a couple of medium tutorials and go like, I guess this is my tech stack now, right? I guess this is how I'm supposed to do my job versus when you take in that more human element starting at like first principles of just like, what are the fundamental problems I'm solving for? Is it simply, hey, what's revenue by month? Okay, I probably don't need Spark streaming <laughs> in my tech stack, right? Hey, like I, my team, we're only gonna hire for like analytics engineers. We, we don't want to, you know, maintain a roster of data engineers or like data analysts, like that changes how you make your decisions. And so like trying to find 
that right level of like challenge to skill set to how much like outcome you need to drive, like that is a better way to make your decision making process to go like, oh, okay, this makes sense to go with DPT Core versus Cloud. Oh, this makes sense to choose, you know, Airflow, Daxter, Prefect, what have you, right? And because what matters at the end of the day is that, you know, tech is not our salvation, people are, right? And so like, what, what's important is like, do you enjoy working with these tools every day? Or are you just doing this for a resume? Or are you just doing this because you saw a blog and you're insecure and you're afraid to carve your own path? And like, it's okay because like, there's things are fast enough and cheap enough where you can fail forward, all right? And not feel like you have to be attached to a particular doctrinal tech, you know, stack. So, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, so I guess I was just wondering, talking about data engineering standards and normalization and all this stuff. How would you measure the performance of your existing data engineering standards, and how often would you revise them? Hmm, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> that's a hard question. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want the McKinsey answer or our answer? <laughs> uh, I think I think what I've seen, like, and I, I've been pushing also internally, is all kind of like community or tribe at different level. So it could be a data engineer tribe or, you know, analytics, even more niche analytics engineering tribe. And rather than saying, you know, we revisit or we do kind of a training every, you know, quarter, but having more it's weekly and like part of, you know, your, your work basically. Learning is part of your work and keeping, you know, up to date with things coming in is also part of your work. And it's a lot given like how fast things are changing, right? So. What I've seen is like internally in, com in, in companies is there is, you know, uh, a rotation of people uh, presenting something and so on. And then the discussion triggers and from there usually sometimes say, oh, but we, we, we figure out like we, we like training on modeling. Maybe we should bring that up. But what I've seen, the trigger is always like kind of a, like a weekly ritual of, of sharing things or uh, watching what's, what's, uh, what's going on. And then that triggers the the the, um, the need to do a specific tra uh, training to to fill the gap. Yeah, that's great. And what what I'll add to that is, I think part of what we need to do is is look at where our profession is being criticized for failing right now. Things like out of control costs, uh, poor management of private data, um, exploding model complexity. And then if we can evaluate those things and target our training standards toward those particular issues that are top of mind issues right now, that's, that's, that's the starting point. And then keep those standards up to date as new technology changes come out and just keep evaluating. I don't know, that's off the top of my head, that's what I'm thinking of, but that's a very good question. I'll have to think about it more. Hey guys, uh, Lindsay from Sakota. Uh, you were speakers at MDS Fest, so thank yeah. you very much. Um, I w wanna follow on from that question a little bit. Um, if you were to build, think about building a training program for data engineers, what, what would you include in that? <laughs> you wanna take that one? <laughs> okay, I, I, I would look, like if you look at the modern data stack, there is uh, specific layers that is important, which is ingestion, transformation, and like activation, which is data warehouse, uh, BI, and then you have a baseline layer with like, you know, DevOps, CI, CD, and orchestration. So I think if you orient your training around those four layers, uh, that's the, the most important, I would say. It's like that's covered basically uh, from end to end. Now, what are you gonna put into those things? That's like a big question because there is so many tools. I think like we 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 shouldn't forget about foundation. So I would start with the basic to be like technology agnostic. Um, if you if you talk about SQL and if you pick a technology for that, um, and then next maybe try. I think it doesn't matter if you take like a fresh new tools or um, I might say something that's really already present in a lot of companies. As long as those foundation are there. So for example, if you use uh, a SQL uh, tool, to, I mean, basically to run your uh, your SQL pipeline uh, like dbt or the competitor, 
I think it doesn't matter as long as you understand what DBT does behind the scene and what's the goal of it, right? And I think that's the most important part of the training. And then to say, hey, by the way, we're going to use that tool because we are not going to build that ourselves. And there is other tools available out there. You know, I so I mentor a couple of people at a time. I was entering eight people at the same time. And I learned something where, uh, especially in this job market, portfolios and those training programs only go so far because hiring managers sniff out really quick, oh, you have good academic theory, but you don't know what it's actually like to do anything. <laughs> and so like I've pivoted my approach to training people to be more just like find a problem that you can use data with to solve at your job, whether you're a data analyst or a project manager um, or a manager that's been out of the technical loop and wants to be an IC again. And then like, oh, okay, that's the problem. Okay, now let's reverse engineer how to solve that. Oh, you probably need a DPT in there or you need a GitHub in there. I mean, one of my mentees, my first thing was like, convince your boss to buy GitHub. Like that's step one. Right. And like, and I think what's powerful about that is they realize like, oh, it's more than just like clicking sign up and getting my username and like making commit and seeing my readme for the first time. It's talking with the manager and figuring out what does it take to convince someone with political power that it's worth the paperwork, time and the energy and the training and the emotional labor to do that in the first place. Right. And I think that that understanding helps you see like is, oh, it's more than just, hey, is Airflow or some other orchestrator worth the technical lift? Is it worth the emotional labor? Do I have the social capital to even make this happen? If I do this, am I willing to spend the time role modeling this for the company, gathering some random YouTube videos and regurgitating that content for the rest of my team, right? And I think that serves as a much better, you know, element for just like actually learning because you, you like feel viscerally like is possible and then too like when you're like interviewing for jobs like people can feel it in your body language of like oh this person has lived through things i see their battle scars and i know that this is more than just academic theory or a medium tutorial that they read right and what i'll add to that is i think th these are great answers I, I think there still is a place for the kind of back-end academic theory and uh one thing i see a lot these days is that because the tools are so easy because Snowflake is pretty much plug and play, you just drop your SQL query in there, we've forgotten a lot about how databases work. And most of the time, it doesn't matter. Most of the time, you don't have to think about how the database works. You just throw your SQL query in there, and it runs. But then when your Snowflake costs start exploding, it's quite often because you don't know how, to, how a columnar database works, and you're running a query that was designed for like an index database on a columnar database, and maybe not clustering properly. And so that's where there still really is a place for some theory and I think that theory should be presented in a fairly general way, not tied to a specific tool, but like theory about how indexes work, how object storage works, how storage systems work, columnar databases, all these things that underpin our technology, those really come in handy when things start to go wrong. Yeah, thank you for your answers. I think it's, um, we don't have time for any more questions. I see some people leaving already, so uh, I will wrap up. But you can find all of us right after if you have yeah, more questions. Yeah, if you have any more questions, you can find all of them right after. And if you want to continue the conversation, I encourage checking out the resource of our three speakers. Song made a video um, about should software engineer become data engineer. Um, and there is the Matthew's book on the fundamentals of data engineering. And I think, Betty, you also have a video uh, on the topic. I have so a lot of videos. plenty of resources. Thank you so much for, for coming and we'll wrap this up. Thanks.